beaucoup de gens euh, autour de la table parlent français, but I would say good morning everyone. My name is uh, Guy Ouellet, uh, with a French accent for sure. I'm the member of National Assembly uh, of Quebec for the riding of Chamédé, just north of uh, Montreal in the island of Laval. Welcome to this uh, meeting of uh, Canada Relation Committee. As you know, uh, we have uh, quite a year since the last time we saw each other in Pittsburgh, and it seems so far, Pittsburgh in July uh, 2019. COVID-19 crisis severely impact the relation between states, provinces, and both federal government in Canada and US. So today we will have a discussion on this important topic. First, I would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the work of uh, Robin uh, Schiminger, the former co-chair of this committee. Thanks a lot, Robin. And I know that uh, having uh, Ken Berlinski uh, uh, on the, uh, on us, uh, with us uh, this morning that uh, you will pass on uh, our best thought uh, to, uh, to Robin. Without further ado, I would like to introduce my uh, colleague from great state of New York, Representative uh, Billy Jones, who is the new co-chair of the Canada-US Committee, and I will ask him to say a few words. Good morning, Guy. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to see you all again this morning, and to those that are joining us uh, uh, today uh, and weren't on the call yesterday or weren't in the meeting yesterday, uh, I. I don't want to go in and repeat myself, only to say um, uh, how honored I am to be the co-chair here of CSG East, and I look forward to working with all of you and working with my co-chair and colleague Guy on, uh, uh, on, on, forming, on, on continuing this wonderful relationship. And uh, I have to give a shout out also uh, to Robin Schiminger. I served with him in the uh, State Assembly and I was telling Ken earlier, please pass along our regards. Uh, I became good friends with uh, Robin and uh, his over 40 years of service in the New York State Assembly is certainly appreciated and all the work that he did on this committee. So thank you so much. I won't go into all the details that I did yesterday because I don't want to um, <laughs> repeat myself, but uh, look forward to a great conversation with Leanne. Um, we certainly know um, the importance um, in, in my region um, and, and with many people on this call uh, from the U.S., uh, we certainly know how important this relationship is with our friends and neighbors to the north, and we want to uh, see that continue. We'll get into a few of those issues that um, we talked about yesterday that are, are creating some friction and that, that I, I, I want um, people to know that even with the uh, the tariffs that were put on, and I, I know we'll get into that conversation soon, um, leaders, uh, uh, county, local leaders, state leaders, and federal leaders from my area came out with a strong statement um, Friday afternoon in condemning those actions from, uh, from our administration. So um, we certainly stand with you. Um, I'm in Plattsburgh right now, my district office, which uh, uh, my, uh, the, uh, Gary Douglas uh, refers to it, and we all refer to it as, um, you know, Plattsburgh is Montreal's U.S. suburb. So um, we like to say that here, that just goes to show the importance of, of, um, of our friends and neighbors to the north in this region, anywhere from trade, tourism, uh, retail, manufacturing. I forgot to mention yesterday, we have, a, we have an airport here in Plattsburgh that we've refurbished and that, that's doing, um, well, was, I should say, doing uh, a wonderful business. And, and we have, um, I would say you uh, go through that airport and, and pre-COVID days in 80% um, of that traffic comes from Quebec and Canada. Um, you can see the license plates in that parking lot. So certainly uh, we, we realize the importance of you and this relationship. Look forward to the conversation today. Thank you, Guy. Thank you, Billy. Uh, for sure, Plattsburgh for Montreal, it's the uh, US uh, shopping mall. It's the closest in the US. Uh, by the way, I uh, just want to tell you and uh, just let you know for those who are uh, new on board that we also have in Canada US uh, uh, committee uh, two uh, co vice president, Senator uh, Rick Sears from Vermont and uh, M MLA Keith Irving from Nova Scotia. So uh, uh, I will uh, 
jump on uh, self-introduction. I would like uh, to ask uh, everybody to introduce themselves. Uh, however, ask the attendees to limit themselves to their name and state and province at the moment, since we only have an hour ahead of us. And uh, like we proceed yesterday, David, uh, you will read the list and the people yeah, will introduce that works out them best. So themselves after. I'm just going to go alphabetically from my list. So, and I'm going to call out first name. So, Jack. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jack. Uh, I work with, with David at PSP. Ted. I'm Ted Arnett, and I'm uh, the speaker of the Ontario Service League. Jill? Jill Belanger, a member of the National Assembly, a writing of Orford, which is right uh, close to Vermont. Ken? Ken Berlinski with Assemblyman oh. Schimmicker's office here in Buffalo, home of the Toronto Blue Jays. Thanks. <laughs> nice. well, Simon Berube, I'm advisor to the National Assembly of Quebec. I'm guessing Lisa, is Lisa on? Yeah, it's Lisa Carrier here from the consulate in Boston. Hello. Hello. Uh, Patrick. Uh, Patrick uh, Giasson, uh, National <coughs> Relations Advisor to the National Assembly of Quebec. Eileen. Eileen's my colleague in the Midwest office in Chicago. Um, I'll skip her, Bob. Yep, sorry. Oh, there she is. I, I did unmute and it and it bounced back. I'm sorry. So yes, I work with our uh, Midwest Canada Relations Committee in uh, the Midwestern office of CSG. Sorry about that. Bob? Uh, Bob Hafner, I'm part of the CSG staff, uh, agriculture policy consultant, and uh, I'm in New Hampshire. Uh, Rachel, your audio working, Rachel? Rachel's from the consulate in New York. She was having technical issues earlier, so she sent me a little note. So she's from the Canadian consulate in New York. Um, Mark. Yes, hello. Also, I'm Mark Rock, also with the Canadian consulate. Uh, I work with Lisa in Boston. Um, Kimberly? Yeah, hi, uh, Kimberly from Ontario. I work with Debbie in Toronto. Uh, Senator Klausmeyer. Kathy Klausmeyer from Maryland, and I'm glad to be here. And it's hot here, too. Yeah. Debbie? Good morning. I'm Debbie Lamantia. I'm from the um, Ontario Legislature, and I work with Kim and work with Speaker Arnett as well. Speaker Murphy. Good morning, everybody. It's Kevin Murphy, uh, the Speaker uh, of the Nova Scotia yeah. House of Assembly. Pleased to be here. Later. Senator Pacheco. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, Mark Pacheco from Massachusetts. I'm the Dean of the Senate here in the Commonwealth. Nice to see everybody. And Mike in Vermont. Yeah, good morning, uh, Mike and Tachka. I'm a member of the House uh, Energy and Technology Committee in Vermont and glad to be here. Happy primary day. Thank you. Yeah. Did I miss anybody? Okay, we're gonna go now to speaker view. Good to see you all and uh, Jack's gonna take care of that and I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, co-chair Guy Wallet. Where did Guy Wallet go? There he is, he's. E? Well, I'll, I'll take over for Guy for a minute here. I've got his text and I'll let you just, just said he was having internet connection problems. Yeah. I saw the email. Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll leave the business for later, but uh, the topic of our meeting this morning is state, provincial and federal relations in the COVID era. Um, and our invited speaker, Leanne Goodman, uh, who is, is senior director of content for Provident communications 
an editor for the Conversation Canada, which is a great for, uh, forum online for what's going on um, in, uh, in the news. Leanne's a veteran journalist and communication specialist who has worked in Washington, Ottawa, and Toronto, covering everything from the political ascent of Barack Obama during her years as a White House correspondent to the fatal 2014 shooting on Canada's Parliament Hill. She's senior director of content at Provident Communications and also works editing politics and business copy for the conversation. Over to you, Leanne. I try to wear both hats because I could not say goodbye to journalism entirely. Um, I'm going to just keep my remarks brief because we want to have a good discussion. So as we all know, I'm just going to talk in broad strokes right now that COVID-19 has had a significant impact on state and provincial relations with the respective federal governments in Canada and the United States. Um, in the US, the Trump administration has delegated a lot of the responsibility, as all of you know on this call, for managing the crisis to the states. And Americans are grappling with a much more serious situation in terms of cases and deaths. In Canada, health is under the jurisdiction of the provinces with some requirements from the federal government. Um, nonetheless, managing the crisis has gone fairly well. Um, COVID-19 is largely under control for now, although who knows what will happen if there's a second wave. Um, and there's certainly been some disagreements arising regarding conditions related to additional health care funding for the provinces. In short, you know, the provinces want more money and the feds are sort of saying, well, you've got to deal with what you've been given. Although lately they've loosened the purse strings a bit more. So let's first look at the Canadian situation. Uh, the Canadian government has spent billions on COVID-19 relief, including the Canadian or the Canada Emergency Response Benefit that everyone just sort of colloquial calls the CERB and the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy to assist Canadians who lost their jobs or were laid off as the pandemic took hold in North America. It ends up being pretty similar to what the American worker is getting, about 600 bucks, um, plus some help for payroll. Um, it depends on your past income and it depends on how much your, your companies are topping you up because some companies are helping out. Um, last month, the federal government released what it called an economic snapshot that indicated that the deluge of pandemic spending would result in the country's deficit swelling to a massive 343 billion this year, which is huge for Canada, like it's just completely unheard of. Um, the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, he's defended the spending in the face of criticism from the right, saying nearly 11 million Canadians have been helped by the subsidies. And he also has made clear that Canada had a debt to GDP ratio that was a lot lower than the rest of the G7 when the pandemic hit. Um, and the country's parliamentary budget officer also recently said the deficit could be manageable without a dramatic increase in taxes and other economists have made the similar argument. They're basically just pointing to historically low borrowing costs, but as we all know, all bets are off in the event of a devastating second wave of COVID-19, which we're all hoping does not happen on both sides of the border. Um, more recently, Ottawa pledged about 19 billion in direct transfers to the provinces and territories to help fund a safe restart of the Canadian economy, which is sort of start happening in various stages across the country. Um, Trudeau previously pledged 14 billion, but a lot of the province's premiers said that amount was not nearly enough to cover their needs. And unfortunately, as we all know, and as somebody who lived in the States for six years, I'm looking south with great sadness and concern. Um, things are a bit less harmonious in the States. Um, under the federal system, the US Constitution distributes decision-making authority. It grants the national government the power to conduct certain activities and reserves the rest of governmental decisions to the States. But who does what, as we all know, is not always clear cut. <laughs> Um, throughout the coronavirus crisis, the White House has made some contradictory statements about who's responsible for key aspects of the nation's response. The president has asserted he has the authority to order the states to reopen the economy, but he's also insisted that it's the governor's responsibility to manage coronavirus testing. So the federal government's $2 trillion response bill is largely directed at providing helps to individuals and private entities. Um, the provisions of the bill that do relate to st state and local government offer opportunities for federal funding. Um, the federal government also retains the authority to administer, to administer the funds. 
So the president has also announced guidelines for states to use when reopening state economies. But consistent with the Constitution, governors have discretion whether to implement these guidelines. So that means it's still up to individual states to craft policies that protect the health and welfare of their citizens. Some states are working closely with the White House and others are coordinating their response efforts with neighboring states, which, which makes sense considering there could be cross border infection rates. If one state next to you has it terribly, you're obviously gonna wanna coordinate. I think that's what's going on in Canada as well. Um, so I'm gonna turn the discussion over to our participants on how the fight against COVID-19 is going for both in both Canada and the United States in the western part or the eastern part of the continent. Um, so let me start with you, Assemblyman Jones. I'd love to hear what's going on in your jurisdiction, what kind of budget hit, how have the public health services been managed? Um, and I know in, in Canada, there have been provinces that have put up barriers. You couldn't go to PEI at all. And I just wonder if that's the same situation in the States. I'd love to hear from all of you. Yes, well, thank you, Leanne. And um, yeah, just to get in, uh, I loved your, um, your presentation. It, pretty, it, it covered a, a lot of what we are going through um, in the in the U.S. and and and, and I can speak for New York. Um, my, you know, I know New York City um, at first, obviously with with good reason was um, was taking a lot of the. Uh, you know, we had the most infection rates out of anybody in the country. It's a very densely populated city, and um, uh, you know, it, uh, it was devastating for us. I live further north, uh, as, as you know, it's, uh, you know, 300 miles away from the city. In my area, we have done a very, very good job with the, with the virus. I, 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 you know, I compliment our local officials and our, our uh, health, local health departments and what they're doing. We've abided by the state guidelines. Uh, Governor Cuomo put down strict, strict state uh, guidelines probably the strictest as uh, uh, anybody in the union, which uh, you know, rightfully so, at the beginning of this, because um, our infection rates were just through the roof in in in, in the death toll. Um, but we're we're doing a lot better now. Even uh, New York City rates less than one percent on a daily basis. Um, the tests are coming back. Um, you know, like I said, in the North Country here, we haven't taken the 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 hit. As, as far as infection rates as much, but we've certainly taken the financial hit. And I will say in my region, with the closure of the, of the border, um, not only affecting families because we're so intertwined here, um, there's heartbreaking stories of, of families not being able to see um, loved ones on the other side of the border or, or friends that, that, that quite frankly, we have you know, you know, had that relationship for years and years and generations. Um, but the financial hit that we will take from the border closure um, will be immense. We depend um, on our friends and neighbors to the north for so much. Um, I would say, uh, and, and I mentioned this yesterday, we have 150 Canadian companies in the Plattsburgh region. 15% of our workforce gets up every day and goes to work for a Canadian company. But regardless of that, when you're talking tourism, um, retail, a lot of a lot of shoppers in the area, man, uh, manufacturing, as I've mentioned, um, and, and the airport that, like I had mentioned before, um, you know, we're we're talking of, about um, camping grounds and, and second homeowners campgrounds. Most of our campgrounds right now they're at ten percent capacity. That's ninety percent of a uh, of 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 the other part of that was from our from our friends and neighbors in the north. Our marinas, our attractions. You know, like I said, our second homeowners. So we are taking a huge financial hit, not only with the COVID um, in the in the shutdown of, that we had to do, um, but also uh, not getting that. Uh, you know, not we mentioned about the license plates before. You hadn't seen a lot of uh, uh, U.S. license plates or New York uh, license plates or Maine, uh, New Hampshire license plates in in, in Canada. We we. We, we we're seeing none of that from our from our friends in Quebec and Ontario and, and the rest of Canada. So, taking a big hit not only from the virus itself and the economics of closing our local businesses down, but we don't have that uh, Canadian commerce and that in that um, uh, uh, like I said, our friends and neighbors um, to the north coming down here. It's affecting it, li it literally is affecting every business um, across the whole border 
uh, region here and, and, and probably further south. I mean, you know, it's uh, affecting the whole state and throughout the Northeast. We heard um, from uh, our friends from Maine and a few other states yesterday and how they're seeing the effects of that. They, they depend tremendously on the tourism uh, of, our, of our friends. So just a short, a short uh, you know, synopsis of what, of what we're going through. Is there a feeling in state legislatures and in Congress that the border should be open and that Canada's being too hardline on that on the border closure? The, the feeling is, and rightfully so, and I and I and I speak from New York here and, and probably Vermont, which is closest to to me, that um, Canada is. You know, you think of New York, people think of New York City. They think of, I mean, our, our like I said, our infection rates are are, are our death toll, quite frankly, was was the highest in the in the country, the highest in the world at one time per capita, and rightfully so, on the seal of the border. But the way we feel now is that we we flatten the curve, so to speak, and that um, you know we think the dialogue should, and I know a few of my colleagues brought this up yesterday, the dialogue should start back up to when you know just turning a no into a no just to say no. Um, let's get some parameters. Like, um, let's get, uh, you know, maybe in 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 30 days, if there if the infection rate stays, the metrics stay stay low, and in, in, in certain kinds of metrics, the answers we're getting in in from um, the our federal government and and um, the Canadian federal government is just no. We're just looking for some light at the end of the tunnel, some answers here. And Senator Klausmeyer, I believe you're on the call. Yes, from Maryland. My place where I lived for six years that I miss every day. I, I was wondering if there are any other lawmakers or legislators. Hi, Senator Klausmeyer. Nice to talk to you. What are some of the state, federal, federal tensions and conversations that are going on right now between the federal government and the states that you think are the most pressing ones, the most concerning? Well, I. I I think, and I've been involved with the unemployment rate, and that's been part of the problem with the the feds giving money and having parameters on what the states can do. But as far as borderline, the only borderlines that we've had were when uh, New York told told us that we had to quarantine if we went to New York, and it's, uh, Delaware. Maryland and New Jersey. So, and the the governor of Delaware was quite upset. Our governor never said anything. Um, but that that to me, the unemployment and just knowing what everybody else has said. Every business is hit hard. Um, the the nursing homes you know, we're watching them very carefully, and they're getting getting their statistics in. Um, so I don't think we're much different than anyone else other than uh, we don't rely on another country like the, the borderline states do. Right. And, but th th to me, the problem is it, going over a line and Pennsylvania is going to have something different. Delaware has something different. And so I, I just wish the whole country had the same kind of parameters and from the get-go, we should have had it. So, but as a friend of mine said, they wouldn't. Have, a lot of people wouldn't have listened anyway. So, but I just feel like the imaginary line of a country or a state doesn't stop the virus from going in. So, so you know, like I said, I think we're with everyone else, and we're we're hurting, and I I just can't wait till it's over. But as Billy said, we need to see a light at the end of the tunnel. But I, I don't see any lights anywhere yet because it just doesn't seem like it's it's going anywhere. So, so. does anyone call want to weigh in on what have been some of the most pressing state, federal government issues, both here and in Canada? Um, what do you think of the biggest challenge have been? Actually, what I'm interested in knowing is what have we learned if the second wave happens? Like, at what are, what lessons are we going to heed from the first wave? But of course, in the states, you're sort of still in the yeah. first. Wave. Well, yeah. let, uh, I, I I just want to say, you know, I 
said about the unemployment, part of our problem towards, I mean, it was horrendous, horrendous. And people were going like two months without getting any money. I don't know if other states were going through that, um, but it, it was not a very transparent kind of uh, function. The, the Department of Labor just kept saying, yeah, well, we're trying our best. We, we hired people. It was very not good, but they are getting back with us. And it's just in case this all happens again, that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, we had, and men, many of the other states may have had it too, that people were scamming the system and you know they worked with, with the federal government through the Department of Labor to find that out. And when I talked to the secretary, she just said every day there's a new scam going on and there are, people are just taking the money. So um, hopefully we have a new system. Hopefully if it happens again, they will be more transparent. That's what I've learned that I just keep saying, you got to let us know and take ownership. Please don't pretend it's not happening. And they were doing that quite often. The governor was doing that and he kept saying everything's fixed, but it, when you get 15 calls from people, constituents a day, it's not fixed. So, so that's what, I, I, again, that's what I hope they can do. And I just hope um, that if money comes to the states that they do it the right way and the right people get the money, so. And my, one of my biggest concerns is, and I, I think we talked about it yesterday, but the evictions are one thing. We don't want to evict anyone, but how about the landlords who own the businesses? So and I think that's something we really have to take a, a look at because they got to pay, they got to pay their dues too. They got to pay, if they don't even own the building, they got to pay for theirs. So. Yeah, that's issue here too. Yeah, I mean, and nobody talks about them. So I'm hoping this, this new package, if it the Small like mom and pop landlords who just have like one or two little properties that are investment properties. It's not like the big institutional landlords. Well, but some people that's their main income. You know, they fix the houses up and rent them out and all of a sudden they have nothing coming in. So it's Is tough. There Anyone else on the call who wants to talk about some of the issues that your state specifically is facing with the federal government or your province is facing with the, with the Trudeau government? I know there's some Ontario um, legislators on the call. So speak up. I'd love to, we want to have a sort of an open freewheeling discussion about the difficulties that this is underscored in terms of federal, state, provincial relations. Don't be shy. All right, I'm gonna go back on my list and I'm gonna find somebody. Oh, there, there, we we Mike. there we go, Mike right. in Vermont. Yeah, um, I'll just pipe in and say that uh, Vermont's had a, a pretty good um, uh, coronavirus uh, outcome at this point. We've only had 59 deaths and, and 1,500 uh, positive cases at this point. And we're, I think most people are, are taking precautions pretty well. And uh, that's, that's been good for the state. Um, we are very concerned about the lack of uh, an agreement on the uh, federal level in terms of another coronavirus relief package. Um, I know people who are really depending on the unemployment benefits in the uh, pandemic unemployment assistance uh, payments that they've been getting. And uh, if, you know, they've gone away by now and uh, it's going to be very difficult for them to uh, continue um, making mortgage payments, rental payments. There has to be a compromise in Washington. And uh, that has to include assistance to the states to, uh, to manage their own programs and everything, as well as municipal programs. 
And if that doesn't happen, then I think that, that we're going to be in a, a, a world of hurt, pretty much uh, like the Great Depression of the 1930s. We have to realize that the federal government is going to have to infuse a lot of money into the, into the economy in order to keep our uh, keep everybody viable. And uh, that's just my thoughts on it. I'm not speaking for Vermont, but I'm speaking from my own perspective. I read an interesting, maybe Guy, if, if he's back on, may want to comment on this. I read something interesting about how in Quebec, uh, there was a hesitance at first to embrace mask wearing because the Bloc Québécois at the beginning of the pandemic didn't really think it was necessary. And as soon as the Bloc Québécois, because they're quite loyal to their government in Quebec, said, okay, let's start wearing masks. Then Quebecers started wearing masks. So I, I wonder too, just about the mask directives in the US and if that comes down to what, what guidance they're getting from their state governments or is it more about the leadership they're seeing or some might argue the lack of leadership they're seeing in the White House how are your states struggling with issues on safety protocols and mask wearings and those sorts of things? And, and as, legislator, as legislators, how do you convince people of the wisdom of wearing them? If anyone would like to grab that one. Yeah, Vermont, uh, our governor in Vermont, Governor Scott, uh, instituted a mandatory mask requirement uh, just a couple of weeks ago. It was uh, quite reluctant to do that, I think, uh, until people started calling for mandatory wearing of masks. So uh, I think that's going to have a positive effect. I think one of the big concerns right now is the uh, number of college students coming in. Uh, Burlington is a, um, a college town. Right. And uh, we've got students returning from all over the country. Yeah. And, uh, both the mayor of Burlington and um, I personally am very uh, concerned that uh, we have the students taking the same precautionary measures that everybody else is been trying to take uh, in order to suppress this virus. Senator D'Alessandro, hi, nice to see hi. you. Thank you, nice to, nice to see you and I see my friend Guy. Good, uh, Good afternoon, Guy. Nice to see you. Uh, just a couple of, uh, of quickies. You know that New Hampshire, <clears throat> New Hampshire, and, and and Canada have a very significant trade situation, and the closing of the border has obviously had a had an impact. We have a lot of Canadian companies that uh, are are in New Hampshire, located in New Hampshire, and uh, provide significant employment opportunities. What the big problem? The big problem for us. Um, uh, obviously is what's going to happen next with regard to the federal government. Uh, the initial situation we had, we had some difficulty with the, the programming of the $600 uh, federal unemployment plus. That, that, that was a significant problem for DES to deal with. Uh, they finally have adjusted to that. I know I, if I've received complaints about anything, it's <clears throat> when am I going to get my unemployment and, and so forth. Now, I've, I've also had some calls about the $1,200 payment. Uh, many people didn't receive it. Uh, just they got to call your congressman with regard to that. So the mask situation, I've asked the governor uh, through uh, through our, our GOFA committee. That's that committee put together. I'm on that committee to, to deal with the $1.25 billion that's been given to New Hampshire uh, to to, to uh, allocate. Uh, I've asked the governor to mandate masks with, without, without any, any success. Uh, I think if we've done anything right <clears throat> in this country and that's been limited, it's wearing the masks and, and, and proper spacing. Those are the things that have saved, uh, saved New Hampshire. And we've had a hundred plus um, deaths uh, and, and most of them in long-term care facilities. Yeah, same so, with you. That's that's been the issue. I think that's that's very significant. What about these long-term care facilities, and when when are they going to uh, to to, uh, to kind of open up? And and the bonus money that we gave to to people who were working in those facilities, the three hundred dollars a week bonus that they received, that that ended at the end of July. And the question is, um, what's going to happen to those employees? Are they going to continue to work, or are they going to try to? To, to find something else because of the lack of the, of, of the bonus. Uh, 
those things I think are, are, are pervasive in, in, in our state. We've been very, very fortunate. Uh, the virus has been pervasive in the lower counties, Hillsborough County, Rockingham County, that's where the action is. We've had counties where there haven't been any, hasn't been any covert activity, particularly in the northern part of our state. When you, when you get to, to, to Coas uh, and the northern counties, it's, it's, it's been very good. It's part of the Canadian border. Yeah, right. Well, well uh, you know, and, and, and that's that's uh, very true. I, 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 I thought we'd have a mad rush to move to Canada, <laughs> but uh, it, that didn't happen. But our Canadian brothers and sisters are just wonderful, wonderful colleagues. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate their, their, their support and uh, have great affection. We've run two... <clears throat> We've run two events, one in Sherbrooke uh, and one in, up in, in northern New Hampshire in, in Whitefield to, to, to deal with the Canadian-American situations. And uh, I'm chairman of the New Hampshire Canadian Trade Council, so we kind of work with that on, on, a, on, a, you know, on an ongoing basis. But I think the uncertainty of what's going to happen is the real concern that all of us should have. What's the federal government going to do? And this nonsense brought forth by the president, this $400 situation which adversely uh has uh, has an effect on on the stability of, of of our government to be honest with you when you uh, eliminate the withholding and that that has a, a a significant effect on social security a significant effect on, 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 on medicare i mean people have to realize that you do these kinds of things and the 100 that should come from the states we don't have that kind of money anymore our, our, we've paid 1.1 billion out of our fund, uh, and that, that includes the federal money and the state money. So uncertainty. We 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 at 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 a time when you need positive direction and positive leadership, that's our problem. We don't we don't have that. We have ambivalence, and that's no good. That's no good for our for our states. It's no good for our country, and uh, it's no good for our relationships uh, universally. You know? I mean, never mind just Canada, but talk talk about our relationships with with Europe when uh, when they refuse to accept uh, American citizens uh, into the European Union. Can, can you imagine? Uh, I, I have family. I have family in Italy, who, uh, who obviously they were in northern Italy, very concerned. So uh, I think the uncertainty. If I could underline one item, it's, it's uncertainty. So kudos. To Governor Scott for, for requiring masks. I mean, it was a, I think it was a courageous move, and it, it should have been done a long time ago. It should have been done a long time ago. If you, I mean, well, in fair, there is some conflicting information from public health authorities. Oh yeah. Oh sure. Well, uh, being told that oh it's no big deal, it doesn't really yeah. might be worse. Somebody yeah. officials are saying in Canada, it might actually make it worse for you. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, you, you, the inconsistency is is another thing that we have to face. Uh, um, that's, that's why I think in terms of leadership, leadership is so important at, at this point in time. And and think of, think of that as it relates to other problems that have come up in, in our lifetime. Nothing like this has ever occurred in our lifetime. No. Uh, nothing. So the 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 example set by by past leaders I, I think is something that we should have immediately fallen back on and taken kind of a, a, a significant action but we we need that you can't you can't survive in, a, in an era of uncertainty you know we we as legislators uh, know that i think as citizens we know that as parents we know that think about the kids going back to school i the, my district i've got over twenty thousand k through 12 students we haven't got <laughs> we haven't got consistency in how we're going back to school yeah. you know so and and that's think of that and think of the social implications of a kid without social interaction what what kind of a dramatic effect that has on on students and if you go virtual all virtual all remote <clears throat> how do you attract these kids think of the effect that that has and someone talked about i, I think mike you talked about college i've got St. Anselm College, right in my district, they started bringing kids in yesterday, 200 at a time. I had Southern New Hampshire University, which just canceled classes. There, there aren't, there, there aren't any classes. So you got again two very different, different points of view. Well, so, we hear from Speaker Ken Murphy, 
to Nova Scotia because Nova Scotia has done pretty well, but I also wonder how the closing of the American border has hurt Nova Scotia, sort of the tensions about PEI, sort of not wanting the people from away coming onto the island. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a bit about that, the province's relationship with the Trudeau government through this whole ordeal. Um, give us a bit of a snapshot of what's going on. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Leanne. You're doing a great job there. Um, I touched on it a little bit yesterday. Uh, we are doing very well in our province. We, we did have a, a significant bump in the road early on, uh, like many other jurisdictions, COVID found its way into our largest nursing home. We only have one that's of this size. And unfortunately, uh, uh, some staff members returning from vacation uh, carried it inside in the, in the first few days of COVID. And as a result, we've had uh, 53 deaths in a 450 bed uh, nursing home. <clears throat> it represents uh, uh, most of our deaths here in Nova Scotia, PEI, New Brunswick, uh, and Newfoundland have only had uh, one or two uh, fatalities each. Uh, so they've been doing very well in very, very low numbers. So the Atlantic bubble, uh, through cooperation of, uh, of the four governments of, uh, of two different stripes, has worked out really well in terms of um, I'm not so sure it's had the economic uh, impact right out of the gate that everybody was so desperately hoping for, but it certainly has served one thing, and that is to give uh, give our people optimism and reason for hope. Um, you know that we can move about uh, this part of the country uh, freely um, and be confident that where we're going is safe, and that when we come back home, our families and co-workers and so on will be safe. Uh, the, um, uh, Lou had mentioned the, uh, the wage top up or the bonus for frontline healthcare workers. That's certainly an interesting dynamic. Uh, uh, in early days, as, as my Canadian colleagues will know, it was, uh, um, it was a chore to keep up on a daily basis. The announcements that were coming out of Ottawa in terms of relief programs and uh, a billion dollars here, uh, several billion dollars there, $500 million for this. Uh, it was difficult to keep up and in, in a few different cases, our province uh, under the leadership of our premier um, took a very slow, cautious approach to those. And of course, sometimes that didn't always wash with the public who you know, would tune into the prime minister's daily briefings um, and to hear that, uh, you know, there's a billion dollars for frontline healthcare workers uh, who, uh, who are there. Um, and then in typical fashion, it was a week or two later after that envelope of money was announced that some of the details of the programming uh, came out. So it kind of left the provinces was fine for the prime minister to announce that, and we're grateful for that, and to to allocate that kind of money. Uh, but the line always was, you know, uh, uh, the provinces in particular, when it comes to healthcare, as you mentioned earlier, it's delegated to the provinces to actually execute. And we were kind of left literally holding the bag of money and uh, trying to sort out how that would uh, distribute and make the biggest impact in our jurisdiction. So. I guess in hindsight, you know, a bit of a pleasant problem to have uh, money coming from the central government to the provinces. Uh, but uh, some of the parameters that were announced didn't quite fit in every jurisdiction. And, and I guess in hindsight, the flexibility was good. But uh, we, we are still, as a matter of fact, there was a press release today um, announced from, from our government uh, that we have finally sorted out the frontline healthcare worker bonus and that will be added to those qualifying workers paychecks in the September 10th uh, payroll run. So that program, don't quote me on it, I think was announced sometime in April and uh, we're just September uh, getting it out. So you can imagine um, the electorate uh, not very patient uh, when it comes to that kind of stuff. Uh, but what, um, one of the things that really concerns me, and I think I touched on this yesterday, is, is when, 
when the financial reality uh, settles into our economy, uh, which like, like all of yours has been basically ground to a halt, um, and the relief tap uh, slows down to a trickle or dries up completely, uh, those businesses uh, from those very small mom and pop shops to large businesses, uh, Halifax is a tourist town, um, you know, we're usually uh, above capacity basically from April to October uh, in terms of our hotel uh, room nights. And uh, we have major properties here that are, you know, that have less than a dozen people a night here at peak season and huge tax bills, property tax bills that they have no money to pay. So I my personal opinion uh, is that the there is greater financial pain to come and uh, and all of our governments are are going to be in the same boat as we try to figure this out together so uh, it, it's part of what i do in provident is i write content for corporate clients and they're having serious supply chain issues because of this whole ordeal like it's cause all sorts of problems and their plan to expand into the states obviously have been put on hold. I wonder if there's anybody who would like on the call would like to talk about sort of the broader trade and supply chain issues between Canada and the U.S. and how much trouble that's causing and with the border close. I know essential things are getting through and goods and, and if you're trucking thing, goods back and forth you can come over but uh, Gilles would you like to weigh in on that? Yeah, maybe on, on the supply chain side, but before that, I, I want to mention, since Lou is on the call, that we do have a wonderful relationship with uh, New Hampshire and also Vermont. Uh, so that's very important for our economy. Now the border are closed. Uh, talking about the supply chain, the problem with that is uh, since the trading, uh, it, it's still working, but it's not very efficient. So, uh, and the way the U.S. is going uh, with the aluminum. So we do have high pressure here uh, to have all our business and all our citizens to buy local. And uh, it's good, maybe on the environment side, but I think it's not that good on the, uh, on the relationship and economy side. In Quebec, we got hit, talking about the COVID-19, we got hit very hard. For a population of 7 million, we, uh, we got uh, about 60,000 cases. That's the one we know, we measure, and uh, 6,000 deaths. So it's, it's significant, but now it's going pretty, uh, pretty well. We, we're following the Canadian recommendation regarding the mask. So back to school full time and uh, from grade five, uh, you will need to wear to wear the mask. The unemployment is going below 10%, which is good. But like my colleague in uh, Nova Scotia, I personally think that we will get hit very hard on the economy because small business, it's totally different than larger business. Small business, they got loan from the government, all the program, but they will no longer, starting September, October, they will no longer have the capacity to... Uh, to uh, pay that debt. So the ratio, which is normally 1.2, you need to, to, pro, to generate 1.2 uh, to cover your debt, is probably uh, right now, uh, thousands and thousands of business are below one. And I'm worried that the bank will pull the plug. So we will probably need uh, some subsidies or maybe uh, sharing with uh, with private and public. So we, we will need to find a solution on that side. But that's that's basically the picture uh, of uh, Quebec. Thank you. Uh, Leanne, uh, we will, we're as close as uh, the end of the meeting, but uh, we will go with Mark. It will be the last question before wrapping up. Senator and I just, uh, thank you, Guy. And <clears throat> let me just uh, thank all of our partners uh, uh, in Canada uh, the relationship between Massachusetts and uh, the Canadian government has always been very strong and healthy. We're working on clean energy technologies together, uh, hydro, electricity, so many things that will be the future of the economy uh, here in, uh, in New England. 
And I just want to underscore what others have uh, uh, spoke of thus far in terms of the looming economic crisis uh, that is already with us, but it's being masked, uh, ironically, uh, because uh, we have put it off uh, until we find out what the federal government is going to be doing in terms of aid to the states, uh, federal aid to the states. In Massachusetts, we're looking at, uh, you know, deficits right now uh, with our operating budget of anywhere from four to seven billion dollars. Wow. Uh, when you take a look at that size of, of the deficit for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the corresponding impact that it has on other states in, in New England, depending upon what happens with, uh, uh, you know, uh, bonding rates that are being impacted, uh, state employees that may need to be laid off, programs that are cut, and taxes raised. If the federal government doesn't uh, step in and act, even if the federal government steps in and acts, uh, none of this aid is free, right? So it, it, there's going to be a way that this needs to be paid for in terms of this COVID-19 uh, crisis that we're all in. Uh, in terms of the supply chain, uh, just look at the problem that we've already had with the supply chain, just with PPE, uh, just getting the pr personal protective equipment that we need uh, to, uh, that's still a problem in many jurisdictions, testing that's still a problem in, in many jurisdictions, contact tracing that uh, very rarely uh, is done in the way that it should be done. Uh, so um, we're proud that we've, we've, we've made the best of a, a, of a very bad situation in Massachusetts and in the Northeast in particular has done you know, fairly well comparatively but when you look at what we're comparing it to in terms of other parts of uh, the country, boy, do we have a long way to go. And, and so we really need to have that federal leadership or national leadership uh, and international leadership uh, that is working on these uh, plans together. Unfortunately, uh, the playbook wasn't taken out and read uh, in terms of the pandemic plan that was there. Uh, for at least our national government to move forward with. And I'm not sure about, uh, you know, the response in, in Canada, but uh, at the local level where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, and we're really trying to put these things into place, when we have to go to China uh, to get masks, and they're the wrong ones, <laughs> we get them back, it's pretty sad uh, in, in when we have such powerful governments in the United States and in Canada uh, that uh, could be working much more closely together on all these issues. So uh, I think we, we've only just begun uh, to see uh, the crisis unfold. As Lou said, when you look at just our schools right now, and even within senatorial districts in Massachusetts, uh, we don't have uh, consistency across the entire district uh, as to what is happening with schools and whether or not people uh, should be going back to schools, whether or not the children should be going back. And there's one thing that's constant throughout this whole uh, thing that we're going through is the virus isn't going away uh, right now. It's going to be there. Uh, we need to recognize it and we need to use the best public health practices uh, to, uh, uh, to try to eliminate it, uh, you know, when we have a vaccine. And even then, we're still going to need to uh, have these public health practices put into place. So uh, that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Leanne. Uh, uh, yeah, we forgot that when we start, uh, I think that uh, Wendell uh, Anniford had a little a message for us. So, Wendell? Oops. Uh, let's see if I can get... Hi, Wendell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, both chairs. Uh, and David, uh, I, I don't mind being skipped over at all. I'm not offended. 
I'm happy to sit in the background, as a matter of fact, and let David Biet do all the work. You um, weren't on the registration list. That's yeah. not a problem. <laughs> um, and, but I, I will make a uh, pitch for two things. I want to say we're very uh, disappointed, obviously, as the state of New Hampshire is that we could not host an annual meeting uh, this year in Manchester. In lieu of, not in place of, but in lieu of that, we are hosting a weekly, actually started out as a Wednesday webinar series uh, with some wonderful nationally recognized speakers talking on a variety of topics. Uh, specifically, we start off, we lead off with on the 13th, or on the 12th rather, uh, Dr. Leanna Wen on the future of healthcare after COVID, topic that uh, you have just been talking about for an hour. Uh, following Dr. Wen, and you probably know she's uh, uh, a Harvard-educated emergency physician, Rhodes Scholar. Uh, she is the author of When Doctors Don't Listen, How to Avoid Misdiagnosis and Unnecessary Tests. Of course, now we're in an era of testing, um, but uh, she's been featured in Time and Newsweek, and I recommend uh, that session to you. A week later, um, we have two back-to-back -back webinars looking at the issues of race, policy, and politics. In the era of George Floyd, how are we uh, responding to some of the challenges that we've faced for a long time uh, in, in the U.S. in terms of not only policing, but in terms of uh, structural racism and how we're confronting those issues. We have uh, both uh, uh, Professor Rothstein, a professor at uh, Princeton, an author of The Color of Law, speaking um, and on that topic. Lastly, we have in the week of uh, the 24th, on August 26th, Rachel Bitkoffer with Politico, political scientist, a reporter, and self-avowed election whisperer. And we're all uh, elected officials, uh, uh, so we look forward to, I'm sure you will too, uh, her uh, diagnosis not only of elections 2020, but just some discussion of polling, uh, what those polls mean, how to read polls, uh, and her theories about negative partisanship uh, and the, and the uh, influence of voter turnout are quite controversial in terms of typical polling, uh, which focuses on the swing voters. So I think she'll have an interesting uh, message and, and dialogue with all of you. So I encourage you to sign up for those uh, individually sign up for those webinars in, in August and uh, hope we'll see you there um, and uh, uh, we finish up the uh, month of August with an executive committee meeting on August 27th so um, again I appreciate uh, all the work uh, that this committee very important committee is doing right now uh, I hope we can get the border over and I'm gonna open and I hope we can get to Toronto because Ontario is our host in 2021. So um, we need to get this figured out <laughs> so we can get back to meeting in person. Uh, and we will get to New Hampshire in 2022, uh, Senator D'Alessandro come hell or high water. And that's, that's he's in charge of that. So thank you for the opportunity to promote. Speaker Arnott, would you want to say a quick word about welcoming us to Toronto? There he is, his mute, your mute's on. <laughs> there we Thank go. You. Yes, again, just to reiterate how much we look forward to hosting the conference in Toronto next year. Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm and excitement uh, within the staff of the Legislative Assembly and the members. And uh, we, we can't wait to be able to host all of you in, in Toronto and show you our very best. Um, it's been a very interesting conversation today, and I, I would very much uh, look forward to participating in the Wednesday webinars that are also being planned for the remainder of uh, uh, the month of August, and uh, keep in touch through, through that means as well. Um, thank you again for organizing this today. And you can find on our website the registration links to sign up for those webinars and for any other policy committees you'd be interested in. Okay. Um, thank you to my co-chairs, but let me get... Let, uh, Guy Wallet, have the last word. Thank you, David. Uh, I think that it's a good idea to have Wendell at the end. So uh, we will have to renew that. Having Wendell and Ted at the end, uh, we're lucky. 
Uh, we're supposed to uh, talk about the uh, next year uh, priority, but uh, after COVID, I think that we will wait. If uh, some of you had uh, some subject that you want us to cover, please pass on to uh, Wendell, David, uh, me, or Billy, and uh, we will make sure that uh, it will be at the agenda of the uh, Canada-US Committee. Yes, time goes so far. It's going fast also. We're uh, two minutes uh, later than yesterday, but we, it's okay. Uh, thank uh, Billy, uh, the co-chair. Uh, I have uh, I approved some internet connection, so uh, thanks for the backup. Uh, special thanks to our guest speaker, Leanne Goodman, who will shed more light on the subject. Uh, you are great, Leanne, so Stress is gone now, and uh, I wish you uh, an amazing day. I hope to see you all again. Uh, thanks, Wendell. Thanks, David, to organize those uh, two webinars. It was great, and uh, it means for us that, uh, yes, we will miss uh, seeing each other in person in uh, New Hampshire, but uh, I hope that uh, it will be ready for Toronto next year. And if you guys from the States are not there, us from Canada, we will travel to Toronto. So, uh, Toronto, bye everybody. January. It's not January in Toronto, is it? No, <laughs> it's in August. Oh, perfect. Ah. No, that's, Toronto's prettiest month. Perfect. You can come in January too if you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, bye. Okay, bye. Thank, Thank you. So Thanks. much. Thanks for a great, bye, really good conversation. Thank you all. Thanks, Leanne. Yeah. Thank you all. Au revoir.